Hi everyone, welcome to another one of our webinars here at Applied Math Modeling. My name is Paul Bemis and I'll be your host for the show today. Um, this month we're going to be taking a look at modeling active tiles and active chimneys with CoolSim 4. Uh, CoolSim has been out now for, CoolSim 4 has been out for over a year. We continue to make uh, enhancements to it now at a rather rapid rate and uh, this month we're going to be taking a look at some of the new modeling features um, that it has as applied to a real life situation. Um, just a note here, the way that the webinar works is that if you want to ask questions, uh, please type them into the questions chat uh, window and we'll take a look at them uh, at the end of the presentation. We generally run about 45 minutes total on the presentation material and then open it up for questions. We're willing to go anywhere you'd like with questions and answer anything you, uh, you have in mind. So please or jot them down or write them down as you go. You can enter them into the chat window as you go and uh, I will look at them at the end. I will be recording or am recording this presentation today so that if uh, you want a copy of it or you want to see it as an archive, you'll be able to see it on our website, our CoolSimSoftware.com website. Um, if you would like a participation certificate for educational credit, professional educational credit, send me a note and I will prepare that for you. So, I'd like to first introduce my panelists. Most of you know me. I'm the president of Applied Math Modeling. I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Magnus Herlin. Uh, Magnus has been a frequent guest on our program, and uh, he is president of ANSYS Inc., and he has been quite active in the involvement with uh, a variety of data center optimization parameters, most notably the RTI and RCI uh, parameters that we use uh, quite heavily in CoolSim. I also have with me today a data center manager, uh, Steve Dobbins. He's the assistant director of data centers at George Washington University. And uh, Steve's been a long time uh, user of CoolSim and uh, he's with us today and we'll be talking about the design that he's working on. Welcome to the show, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Now, uh, before we get going, I want to do a few definitions. Most of you have seen our program before and know what we're talking about or know what these things are, but uh, every once in a while, of course, I get someone who has not, so I want to make sure that uh, I level set and define all of my three-letter acronyms. So we'll be talking about PUE, and uh, DCIE, which is the universe. And these are measures of um, how well the going into the data center is being utilized. Um, we know that we have to power the servers, of course. That's the IT load itself. That's the denominator of this equation. In the numerator, we're comparing the IT load with all the other load that's required in order to make it work. In other words, it's total, total energy. So in the numerator, you have cooling, as a matter of fact. The big piece of it is cooling, plus lighting, plus anything else, UPS, anything else that's required to care and feed for the IT load. So, um, you know, a good PUE would be around 1.2. Um, that means that uh, everything is, you know, roughly a quarter or a little less, 20% uh, of, of the overall total. Um, but I've seen them as bad as 1.8. I've seen them upside down where the amount of cooling required to cool the data center exceeds the amount of IT capacity in the data center. Not a good thing. So. It's not unusual to see a one-to-one -one relationship between the IT load and the power required to cool the environment. The, uh, the other two metrics that we're going to be using today, one of them is RTI. <clears throat> this stands for Return Temperature Index. And uh, this can be looked at from two points of view. Uh, I tend to look at it from an airflow point of view because um, we're in fluids. And we're a fluid dynamics company. And uh, what it is, is it's the ratio of the rack flow rate, the required rack flow rate, rate compared to the end handler flow rate. So the way to think about this is that you want the flow rate for the rack in total to be exactly equal to what's coming out of the crack unit to give you the 100% value. It needs to be balanced. Now for your rack or your server, a good rule of thumb to remember is that about for every kilowatt, you need 156 CFM to cool it. And that's just a balance that comes from your basic heat transfer equation, which is, of course, that, that the heat transfer is equal to the mass flow rate times the density times the delta T. So to maintain a delta T of approximately 20 degrees, you need about 156 uh, CFM at sea level 
to be able to keep that uh, a box from running away. So if you have a load in a rack and it's a XKW, you can think to yourself in your mind, well, I need about 150 CFM per kilowatt in order to make that happy. And this will give you a good idea of what to do in terms of tiles or, <clears throat> excuse me, other things that are necessary to uh, feed that air to it. You can uh, look at it as temperature as well. The delta T's have to be the same. The air handler delta T has to be equivalent to the rack delta T. And you want these to be 100%. Uh, if it's greater than 100%, then you have net recirculation on the rack. If it's less than 100%, you have it on the on the uh, crack or the cray or the craw or the air handler, however you want to say it. Now, uh, I see more of the latter. I see net bypass more than I see <laughs> recirculation. It's unusual to, to have it uh, um, with net recirculation on the rack. It's more typical to see it where the air handlers are over-delivering, and that's generally because you build your data center for a future load capacity that you haven't yet achieved, and so you're always running underneath that, and when you run underneath that, you end up with net bypass airflow is uh, generally what happens. These are the equations for it. Uh, this is a, the next one, rack cooling index, and rack cooling index really is a measure of conformance. Does it, does it comply with the ASHRAE uh, standards, the ASHRAE thermal guideline, with respect to the inlets. We're looking here at rack inlets and we're trying to determine uh, if there are spots on those rack inlets that are exceeding the maximal, max allowable uh, temperature as measured by the recommended standards of 64 to 80. So in CFD we, we mesh the front of the racks and we, uh, we uh, interrogate the mesh points, the cells, and we look for temperatures that are over 80.6 and we, we report those. If you were using temperature measurement devices such as um, sensors in a data center, you would typically put one at the top, one at the middle, and one at the bottom. You would have less points than we have in CFD, but you would still be able to achieve the same result of determining whether or not you have any, any uh, hot spots or any, any racks that are in trouble. These tend to be optimization parameters because what you're driving here for is 100% on both RTI and RCI. RCI high looks at the over temp condition, RCI low looks at the under temp condition. The under temp condition isn't catastrophic, of course, because it, uh, you know, machines will run when they're very cold, but it's, it's a waste of energy to run with your RCI, um, you know, in, in, in less than 100% because it's, it uh, means that you're just too cold and you're wasting energy. Okay, so those are our metrics. Now let's get into the model. This is, this is uh, Steve's model. This is one of his data centers down at, at GWU in Washington. It's a little under 6,000 square feet. He's got about half a megawatt of total cooling capacity, which translates into about 70,000 CFM of total of flow rate through the cooling system. He's currently got 183 kW of load, so a little under 200. 81 racks, they're averaging about 2.8 kW per rack, if I do just a straight average. And uh, he's been asked, as many of you are being asked, <laughs> can we drop in some HPC racks? Um, and if so, will they work? And then what's the impact of putting them in there? Now, uh, Steve, let me just open it up and ask you at this point, um, about this, I think these, uh, you're a research institute, these are probably related to some, some grants or some research work that's going on at your university. Is that true? You're correct. We just, um, research has become a bit major initiative here, and what we're trying to do is come up with a, a common research platform so that we can take advantage, instead of each individual researcher buying their own hardware, um, we're trying to pull that so that we can really uh, provide the researchers compute cycles, right? So we can be more efficient and spend less on hardware and really keep it updated and, and more provide a optimal use for compute cycles, right? It's something I've heard a lot of universities talking about. I've uh, had a similar problem. I know we worked with the University of New Hampshire and they are a similar situation as well. So now let me bring up the base model here. I'm going to show you results right away. Um, this is the model. I can show it to you a couple different ways. This is in the post-processor itself. And uh, 
we can show it this way. The other way I could show it, by the way, I'm showing you results inside of a PowerPoint presentation from CoolSim. One of the nice things about CoolSim is that I can review all the results at the same time outside the application um, without having to, to fire the application. I do actually have the application running here in the background, and I'll bring that up as well to show you what the model looks like. In um, This isn't the base model, but this is the layout of his room. And I'll bring this up to full screen so you can see it. Um, this is kind of the top-down view of the room, and uh, this is the new addition of the equipment over here that uh, we'll be modeling, so I actually brought one up with the equipment in it. But assume this isn't here for a moment, and this is kind of the layout. And if you want to just uh, talk about the history here and so forth, that would be great. Is this a relatively new data center, or what, what have you got here, Steve? Well, it's um, fairly old. It was initially built 2002-2003. Um, the main design was predominantly for about 3 kilowatts per rack, mm -hmm. which is what we were dealing with here, cabinet. Mm -hmm. um, we had recently gone through an upgrade where we've been able to add in a return funnel um, above the drop ceiling, which hadn't right. been the case previously, mm -hmm. as well as uh, we had just gotten, we converted one of the crack units from a um, DX unit to a chilled water unit. Mm -hmm. Two of the other units are chilled water and two of the other ones are DX units. Um, so I believe this one's a DX right here, correct, lower right yes. hand corner. The other one is up on this side. It's the next one over, okay. right there. Yeah. Right. So those two are DX, the other ones are chilled water. Mm -hmm. um, it just wasn't, um, we didn't want to make that major of an investment into putting everything chilled water because the building itself was, uh, it was a previous uh, manufacturing facility. Mm -hmm. And so this floor used to be manufacturing floor. And so the building's chilled water system is 25 years old. Yeah. We actually had to put a new chilled water system on in order to isolate the data center from the rest of the building. And we only wanted to um, really enable enough to get the chilled water for three of the crack units to really carry the bulk of the load if we needed to and utilize the DX more from a, uh, an N plus one perspective. Yeah. Um, basically, that's how this set up. Um, the floor itself, it's only a 12-inch raised floor mm -hmm. that we're using as a supply plenum. Uh, most of the grading is, you know, we've kept it fairly open because we just can't get enough air through a 12-inch race floor. Yes, yes. Um, and so it's primarily where we place the uh, HPC cabinets is, um, was basically the only open floor space we had available. Right. Um, in fact, the open area just north of those cabinets used to be um, a network operations center that we've since had to tear down in order to make room for this as well. Yeah. So, you know, typical case, you're trying to, to put, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of density into a room that uh, is older, it's only a 12-inch floor, and uh, it's, it's a challenge, right? Yes. Okay, let me pop back over to the, uh, to the base model here and uh, display it. So here is the results of the base model. We'll start to go through those a little bit here. And I'm saying, let me start with just the report. Um, we take a look at some report, text report that's, and by the way, these results are right automatically every time you do a cool sim run. So this whole set of hyperlinks and this whole format are always generated, and it's a very handy way to look at a lot of variations quickly. So look at our total flow rate through racks, so 70,800 CFM. And our total load at this point is um, required is only 17,000. Total heat load, 183 kilowatts right here. So we we have more air uh, coming at the system than we need. Um, and you see here the total flow through the racks is 24, just about 25,000, and we're delivering 70. So if we scoot down and take a look at our RTI, um, there we go right there, Magnus, 35%. <laughs> so that means, yeah, very low. It means we're, we're more than twice, almost three times. Uh, off in terms of the balance, which is going to translate. You notice the RCI and our, uh, the RCI high and low are both fine. They're 99 percent. But look yeah. at the delta T's. Look at the delta T's. They're 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 terrible. I mean, I've got six degrees on one of these. I've got six degrees here. Um, right. A lot of bypass air there. A lot of bypass air. 
And if we take a look at the airflow, which is one of these plots here um, down further, you can see the, so here is the airflow from tiles right here, and this is fairly good representation of what's going on. And uh, we shouldn't see any path lines getting into that, into the ceiling there. That ceiling should be empty because all I'm showing is the path lines. The, the, the path line is a, the, the way you can think about this is a piece of part, particle particulate has been injected into the airstream from the tiles uh, to wherever it goes and stops. Now it should be going straight into the rack and stopping, but you see it's going everywhere, and in particular it's recirculating a lot in this region, a lot of, a lot of bypass airflow here, which is why that ratio is so poor. So this is a good illustration of what's happening in the room. This is what's making the delta T's so poor. And, and the thing about the delta T's being poor on air handlers is that um, because when the return temperatures are low, the compressor has to work all that much harder to try to, uh, to, 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 to compress up to a level where it can reject into the outside atmosphere. In other words, you know, in, in Washington, he's dumping sometimes into 80 degree, 90 degree atmosphere. And to take a return temperature, you know, that's uh, shown here, if we take a look at again at our return temperatures, and we say, well, okay, I've got a return temperature here of, of 75, I'm as bad as 70 degrees. And now I have to uh, jack that thing up to 90 degrees in order to dump it into the outside atmosphere. That's a 30 degree delta, that's a big lift. Uh, the compressor has got to pump, compress to a 30 degree delta. Whereas if he was returning at, uh, say, uh, 90 degrees, or, or, you know, at least if he had a 20 degree delta, his supplies are low too, 64. But if he was, if he was coming back at 84, almost 90 degrees, then he wouldn't have to compress that much to dump to the outside atmosphere. So that's where you chew up all your energy, is uh, re poor return temperatures. The other thing about air handlers and, and crack units is they all perform better when the delta T's are high, and that's just a, a basic uh, uh, element of uh, heat transfer. The greater the delta T, the greater the heat transfer, um, and it's typically nonlinear. So, um, so those are performing pretty badly. Um, but if we take a look at the uh, recommended range, and this is a, a kind of a go no go uh, chart here, or we sometimes call these Visine charts. The Visine chart is the get the red out idea. So here's the conformance, 64.4 on the bottom to 80.6. This is the ASHRAE recommended range, and we've colored that in green. So anything green is within range. If you're blue, you're below range. If you're red, you're above it. And you can see that we're, for the most part, green. There's one little tiny hotspot way up at the top that I wouldn't even worry about right up there because it's probably not there really in real life. But um, you see here that we're conforming. So I would say at the beginning, you know, you're in good shape before you drop in the heavy load. You notice that load's not here right now because we haven't, this, this is the base model. Um, but as soon as you put that load in. One other thing I wanted to just point out here is this, uh, here's a temperature slice uh, at six feet. And we notice already there's some asymmetry here, Steve, right? That when you walk through this room, it's hotter at one end than at the other, I would guess, yes. right? Yeah. Yes. Now we're going to make a W right here. <laughs> so, okay, roll forward. So we're going to add seven HPC racks. There are 157 kW of additional load, approximately. He's got five 28 kW racks in there. Uh, assuming active chimneys for the 28 kW units and passive chimneys for, for the other racks. Yes. So, unfortunately, you didn't have much place to put them, so you had to kind of sneak them in over here, right? Yes. It was, um, we were lean locked, um, like I talked about before. Uh, that was pretty much the only open space where we could put seven cabinets together. Um, we had to run additional power, so the PDUs on, each, on both ends of that row Mm -hmm. were new related to the row and then at one time when we initially started there was an office towards the north end of that row as well. Mm -hmm. So this was really the only open available continuous floor space for us to, to land. Mm -hmm. Now the way we modeled these originally, and Steve actually you built this model, I didn't build it, I've just been playing with it and looking at it. So um, the way that we built it or you built it 
is we assumed average watts per rack because uh, you didn't know what that distribution would look like. Average watts, and the way we modeled it is to put the rack inside of a container and then put the active chimney on the container. So this mimics the behavior of uh, the active chimney kind of component. This is uh, open gate in, in this case, I believe you've put in here, correct? Yes. Yes, open gate's the active chimney. And you can see the, uh, the uh, airflow coming out of those in the, the path lines from racks and PDUs. If you uh, take a look at this plot, you'll see the, uh, the heat coming out of there and back to this cooling unit. And you'll see it coming, of course, right out of the back of these cabinets and up into the, up into the chimney. So that's working according to plan. Um, and you see if we back out that all the heat's coming to this crack unit. Both good news and bad news, right, Steve? I mean, the good news is it's coming back. The bad news is it's the only crack <laughs> around. Yeah, you know what happens? When, yeah, uh, that's, and that was one of the things I liked about Coulson is as we run these simulations, what happens should that unit be turned off, right, like whether it's a failure or something else. Yes. I can, we can better model how, uh, how the room will react with this sort of heat load. Right. Now, it acts as a guide, right? I mean, it it's, uh, gives you a better feel. You were mentioning that when we were talking about it earlier, that what CoolSim does for you is give you a better feel for what's going on? Correct, right? So, I mean, even just um, from building the model, seeing how everything is placed, and then going through and seeing these plots, it, it gives me a much better idea of um, the kind of cause and effect, uh, and even... Um, as we were doing some adjustments when we initially put this in, being able to move um, floor tiles as well as uh, ceiling grids uh, to adjust their flow, it gave us a way to sort of model that before we went about doing the physical work. That's right. And so it's it, it's really been helpful just in us being able to do some of our brainstorming and what if to get, although you know it's, it's not perfect, right? We couldn't model down to the exact level of detail even within a cabinet but it, it makes me smarter than what I am before. That's right. So, I mean, the model does, it, it helps me get better, which is really what Michael was. That's right. And also, Paul, I think this demonstrates quite well the, the benefit of doing some modeling because in this particular case, that hot cluster there, for that one to be dependent on one crack unit it might not be a, a particular optimized solution. Right. So let's take a look, first of all, at... Uh, at the summary report again, and let's go down to our, our metrics, RCI, RTI, and RCI. And, and you see here we've improved, you know, that, that but what's happened here is the racks are now consuming more flow than they, need, than they were before, uh, so, and with those extra racks, so the RTI improved. But look what happened to RCI. It dropped 88% where it was up at 99% prior. And if we go take a look at our recommended uh, range for rack inlets, we're going to see that it's complaining a little bit here near this uh, section of the room. Um, you see that, uh, that we've got some hot spots in here that we're, that we're uh, indicating. And, and you have, uh, you've got a couple of these in already, right, Stephen? You have noticed some of this effect, right? Yes. Um, you know, we are... The people who are running the cluster have come back to us and talking to us about changes in temperature, whether you know, down at the, we're almost seeing a 20 degree difference in temperature from the bottom of the cabinet to the top of the cabinet. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to address that as well. So if we take a look at the full range of temperature, we'll probably see that too. Here's full range. This is just another plot. And we're seeing down at the bottom 64 and we're seeing it up at the top, well, yeah. 80s, 90 degree temperature up at the top. So the model is, is actually reflecting in real life. Now, to the degree of accuracy, let me uh, pause the PowerPoint for a moment and go back to the model. I'll show you uh, what we did and how we modeled that. Um, so here is the, uh, the model, and I'm just going to be uh, flipping it around a bit here. So I hope your, your, this go to meeting is able to keep up with me a little bit. And I'll stop once I get it into position. But the way that we model it is we, we build a box uh, and put a rack, which represents effectively the servers, the stack of servers inside, and we let it pop through the, uh, the front just a little bit. So you see I'm moving it a bit there just to let the server rack, the stack of servers, pop through that, uh, the front of the, uh, of the, of the 
cabinet and that allows them to breathe, that allows the inlets to work uh, as they normally would and then it displaces the amount of heat and here you can see that I'm, I'm just going to right mouse click that, that cabinet and I'm going to bring up the editor for that cabinet and we're going to see the specification set for 28 kW. Now we're assuming a, a d delta T of 40 in this case Steve that's what you put into those units right? Yes. So the flow rate per, per rack is about 2,000. Now if you dropped it to 20 that flow rate is going to go up. So the required flow rate, you probably got that from the manufacturer of 40 degree delta? Yes. Yeah. As well as we've got it from the manufacturer now as well as um, our HPC folks mm -hmm. who've been trying to take measurements have been able to see that as well and validate that. Now you could, you know, if you wanted to spend the time, um, uh, model this a little differently. What we didn't do in this case, the other way to do this is to put the rails here specifically instead of letting this assumes the model that we're building right here, the way we're doing this assumes no leakage between the servers and the rails, the side rails and the bottom rails. If you wanted to spend more time, uh, you could put these pieces of, of, of vertical and horizontal baffling in there according to what leakage you think occurs. But uh, again, to your point, Steve, it's a question of, of labor. How much time do you want to put into the model to give you the level of guidance that you need in order to make decisions. And, uh, Agreed. And, then, and even in this case, you know, we did take a lot of time and we've taken a lot of time since then really trying to reduce that amount of leakage mm -hmm. through the rails. Mm -hmm. um, but then given that we built this with a baffle where we can change the percentage of leakage mm -hmm. from a modeling perspective, we felt that we were, we were pretty accurately representing it. You know, once we've sort of, we've done some foam and everything. Yes. Um, around the, the equipment and everything to try and really seal up any sort of, uh, you know, to contain the hot air from the supplier. Yes. Really, and I think having the model working with the baffles helped us with where we could account for some leakage yes. on a percentage basis. So it was, uh, it, I mean, it was a way that we could, you know, there are things we did physically to help um, draw this closer, yep. but then the model, the modeling it this way also helped us as well. So what he's referring to there is that you can turn on airflow through the baffle. I opened the editor just now for that front baffle and you can set the airflow. So you can, you can simulate leakage as well a couple different ways. You can either put the gaps in uh, directly or, or you, can, you can just turn this on and let a little bit leak through the, to, to, to uh, represent either case. Now the other thing I wanted to just show here is that I did add some active tiles. One of the things that I was worried about when I started working on the model, Steve, is that the velocity of air uh, coming out of the bottom of this unit uh, can be quite high uh, because of proximity. Mm -hmm. You're very close to those racks. So I snuck, you see in blue here a couple of active tiles. I've got three active tiles on this side and two over here where I'm trying to, these active tiles have uh, fans in them made by companies like um, um, Active uh, Tile or um, Adaptive Cool and also Tate has them as well and uh, they have fan trays in them and they pull and sometimes these are helpful particularly where you've got a small plenum like that and you're trying to p really pull the air up but you'll notice that, uh, that I still get some bending going on if we go back to my presentation here and look at this in full screen mode um, you'll see that. So let's let's go back here to um, this model. This is the model with HPC in it and let's look at uh, the flow rates coming from the, the path lines coming from the tiles because what you'll see here is some of the bending that's occurring as a result of the Bernoulli effect. So if we if we get in closer and take a look we see that these path lines are bent. You see them they're coming they're coming in, but they're they're kind of racing by. There's <laughs> there's very high velocity under this floor because it's only a 12 inch floor. So getting the air to come up into this region is going to be problematic because it's like small velocity. This thing I think is running about 10,000 thousand CFM. So we've got very high velocity flow underneath for in a horizontal direction, and we're trying to get it up, uh, take take a right angle and go straight up, and it doesn't do that easily. It's unhappy about that. Air is pretty lazy. It's going to go wherever it can, least path. So I put active tiles in here trying to encourage it, trying to pull it. But, uh, and they worked, but, but, you know, but still we have a situation here where 
we take a look at our recommended temperature range, you're going to see those path lines that we just showed being reflected almost perfectly in the color variation across the front of these racks. So here's your air coming underneath, and because it can't get straight up, you've got that big delta T across the front of those racks. I have a question for Steve. Uh, Steve, are you having, do you have turning vanes installed underneath uh, the crack unit? No, we don't. Okay. Not at this time, right? So we were trying to push it down. The, although the, we looked at turning veins possibly being as a, as a solution, uh, my only concern was does that just increase that airspeed even more? Because well, I, so I was going to say that uh, you, uh, sometimes turning veins can actually make the situation worse by, yeah. by directing and speeding up there into uh, an aisle with tiles. So that's why I asked you, because if you had turning veins, one way to maybe try is to remove the turning veins and see how it works in them. No, uh, agreed. Um, and, and we looked at it uh, because even without the turning veins, we're seeing a lot of leakage elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And so we've been spending a lot of our time trying to patch up a lot of the leakage um, around the floor uh, so that we can, you know, still drive uh, greater static pressure versus having a turning vein, which we, we figured would speed up the, the airflow. Right. Um, here is the, uh, the the airflow coming out of those the, the bottom of those cracks that crack right there and you see it is going it is going to the sides as well as to the front mm -hmm. so no turning vein and the other thing he has to be careful of here is is his depth is so short that uh, that he's going to run into a problem with uh, delta p at some point he's going to start walking the fan curve on this tray um, unit here this is actually a dx it's a crack unit. So what's going to happen is that eventually he'll uh, get to the point where the delta T, uh, P pressure is so high that the flow rate doesn't really uh, get to the flow rate that, uh, that he wants uh, for that reason. And you notice here that we've got velocities. Look at the velocities here, 6,000 feet per minute uh, coming across this thing it's in its peak. So we've got tremendously high velocities coming through uh, this region. And there's some animations. The other thing about CoolSim is it does uh, uh, create animations uh, if you're interested in those for, for all of your cut planes and all of your path lines. You see the asymmetry there and the temperature of that room uh, ranging from uh, you know high 90s at one end of the room to uh, 64 at the other end of the room. Not unusual. So the question of failure mode was one that we, we talked about uh, just a moment ago. And one of the features now in CoolSim is that you can set up a, uh, a series of runs. So you can take a look at your failure mode by using a simple little tool that allows you to set up, a, given a certain geometry case and a certain uh, number of cooling units, you can walk through and, and uh, change them. Here all I've done is simply uh, turn off crack units in, a, in an order that I was interested in looking at. The one that I was most interested in looking at is what if we lose crack three? That's the one that's adjacent uh, to those uh, uh, high density servers. And I left all the parameters, the other parameters constant. Um, you are able to vary these parameters where you can uh, change the flow rate or the supply temperature for any of the cracks for each of the runs. And in version 4.2, we uh, allow you to submit four runs at once. So you're able to set up a single case, single geometry, and then vary the parameters of just crack units today. In the future, I hope to do more than crack units, but at the moment, crack units. And the variables we allow you to interact with and change are on off state, flow rate, and uh, supply temp. And when you get the results back, it comes to you in this format. These are uh, the results from this case, uh, run with crack failure uh, modified. and uh, you, it's kind of a master. So here I have run zero. To look at the results for run zero, I just use this hyperlink. And there's the uh, one for one and two and three. Again, I'm showing you this in PowerPoint. You can view this all in PowerPoint, which is a very excellent way to review a variety of um, scenarios all at once. And uh, let's do first look at the first one we did because there's no log on the top. So we just put it. It gives indication there's no heat coming back. And it's just a decoration, but it does allow you to understand uh, what's going on. 
And uh, I bet we'll find, Magnus, that the, uh, the ratios are better now. If we take a look, oh yes, look, we're up at 71 now in RTI. <laughs> uh, but as you can see, we're, we're, we're 68 on uh, RCI high, which means we've, got, uh, we've still got bypass airflow, and now we're exhibiting hot spots. So let's take a look. The one I always look at first is uh, rack inlet recommended range. And we see here that we've we've got problems. We've got you know, over here in one section we're completely out of range. This this uh, set over here is out. Even if we look at um, allowable, um, we're out. So again, over here, this furthest one over, um, 28 kW unit over here, is uh, causing problems. If we look at the full range, let's take a look at what temperatures are actually being generated over there, and we find that our rack inlets are getting upwards of, of 90 degrees, 99 degrees over in this region. Um, interestingly enough, it's, it's cool near the middle, it's hot near the bottom. Um, so it's not an N plus one design, Steve. You, I guess you've concluded that by now, right? Yeah, it was sort of something we, we figured we were going to run into with um, as we put this amount of heat load into one section. Mm -hmm. um, again, another reason why why we put this in a model, right? Yeah. So that we could see it, we can prove it. You know, I could show management to say, "Here's where we're susceptible," and come up with some alternatives. That's right. I mean, CoolSim is a tool that allows you to visualize um, your situation so that you can argue for change, whether it's change in one direction or another. Right? I mean, it it gives you that I don't know mechanism for allowing you to see what's happening and uh, realize the, uh, the consequences and show other people the consequences. So let's take a look at uh, the uh, air coming from the tiles here. We probably won't see much activity over in this region. I mean, we're, we're not getting enough air out of here. We do have, you know, uh, the, part of the reason for the asymmetry there is I think I've got the active tiles over here and no active tiles over here. So uh, that's part of the reason. That we don't uh, that we're causing problems in that end of the room. Uh, we're also stealing from this section. Of the, this crack is the one supplying all the cooling load. If we take a look at our summer report, you'll see that reported here. That crack over there is um, crack called Liebert two, and you'll notice that it's dumping 133 kW out of that unit <laughs> with a supply temp of 64 degrees. Now that's only rated at 105. So uh, it's it's it, it, you're right at the upper upper end of that particular unit, and uh, that is a chilled water unit, I believe. There, right? Yes, yes, it is. So the chances are, you know, I mean, the thing about big delta T's like you're seeing here, you're seeing a 34, uh, 34 degree delta T across that unit. Uh, as the delta T's go up, the cooling capacity goes up with it. Chances are that would work. Uh, but you're right on the upper limit of that unit. It's the one doing all the work in the room. It's the one supplying all the air in the room. Um, so one of the things I wanted to sort of point out to you is we're right at the upper limit on that one. As we go around the room and shut other units off, uh, I haven't had a chance to look at these results yet, but let's take a look at this one. In this case, we've shut that Liebert 2 unit off here, so it's now down and the others are all are working. Let's take a look at our our situation again. Not too bad. I mean, it's that one's not as bad. You've still got a little little trouble over here. Might be worthwhile to put a couple active tiles in over there or something else. I'm going to start to recommend other stuff in a moment <laughs> to you. Uh, but one of the things to notice if we take a look at the cut plane at six feet here, straight across the room, still got a lot of heat in this area of the room. Uh, of course, you see inside the uh, the active chimneys, those cabinets are going to be warm, of course. But in this region of the room, we've got a lot of heat. And one of the things I was noticing when I looked at the model and started to uh, to get into this, and, and, you know, this is all new to me, too. I hadn't been playing with this model until recently. But as I was mentioning to you in the, in the, in the lead up to this webinar, here you've got essentially uh, hot coming out of units in this part of the room uh, and dumping right here too over into this region. 
So you've got two, and these aren't trivial. These are about 3KW a piece, I believe, Steve, right, these uh, units? Yeah, they're a little higher. They're probably about um, 6, 7KW mm -hmm. per unit. The, the one is a storage array, and yep. the other one is um, another research grid um, by another university that we're supporting, but it's it's more the it's half filled with 1U boxes, right? So um, the, the electrical yeah. measurements are putting us around 6, 7KW. And you can see what's happening yeah, here. So this is a, these are the path lines that are coming from those units, and you see what's happening here is they're, they're coming out into this section of the room. So uh, the heat from, from these units is contributing to the problems associated with the front of this rack right here, this region. And you can see it best right there where they're coming out and just wrapping right around the corner. Now these are, these are again, um, um, it's this set right here. These are path lines from the racks uh, back to the cooling unit, and you can see some of them hanging around inside that room, causing me trouble, like right there, coming up and feeding back and, and causing this part of the room to be hot. So let's go take a look at the other cases. That one's uh, not as bad as the first. I figured the first would be the worst. You know, that is to say the one closest to it would be worse. Here's one over here. This is far end of the room. If we take a look at, again, uh, recommended range, we'll find that uh, we see about the same. Having a little bit of trouble here in the center on that run, but uh, charts look about the same in that case. And then run three is with this one off over here. And uh, we take a look at the same plot there. What's interesting to note is, is the effect that these various conditions have. You can't predict it. You, if, have you noticed that about airflow, Magnus? Kind of hard to predict, isn't it? I think I think this is a great example how that uh, how that is working. You're shutting off the unit in one corner and. Uh, and the top racks uh, in, other, in the other corner is affected. That's exactly right. Because what's happening here is that uh, when you have two cracks on that are apart from one another like that, opposite size, the pressure builds fairly good in the middle of the room. Um, but when you shut a crack off, uh, the pressure often will, will, will occur in the opposite side of the room. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's hard to know until you make these runs what to expect. And oftentimes you'll be in a situation in a data center where something's happening, you can't figure out why. You kind of scratch your head and say, well, it doesn't make any sense. You know, this crack unit is closest to these, these devices. It should be fine. But no, as it turns out, it's cooling the other side of the room because it's blowing all the air over there. The pressure is building up on that side. By the time the air gets over there, the velocity is low enough so that the pressure rises. You get cool racks over here and hot racks over here. <laughs> It's really just counterintuitive sometimes until you build these models and look at them. So, um, and, and also the reality might be a little nastier than the clean model because um, it, it's, it's very hard uh, uh, to figure out exactly how the underfloor looks like. Yes. You might have obstructions from piping or cable bundles and things like that, and that will direct the air in different paths, and it's very, very hard to predict what's going to happen. Right. And for you to capture it all in a, in a tool or in a model would take a very long amount of time. Now, sometimes you do need to do that, and you can. Certainly, uh, in this model, you could put underfloor obstruction in place. Um, but it takes more human time, more modeling time, and it depends on what you're looking for. If you're using it as a guide, just as a guide to try to understand the behavior of what's going on in the room, then uh, sometimes less is better because it gets busy. Even in results, um, if you take a look at path lines, for example, uh, there's a lot going on there, and you know that's not the level of detail that uh, that you know it could be. So, awful lot going on, and again, we've seen an awful lot of bypass airflow back in this region. It's really becoming a very good educational tool uh, that you you start to realize uh, that what you thought was the truth before is not really the truth. Right. Yes, and even engineered solutions, Magnus, like containment, you know, uh, boxes with containment in a data center like this, 
often run into trouble that you and I have seen where you put a container around it and you still got high velocity air going by it and the mm. container looks pressurized to the airflow and so it just goes somewhere else. <laughs> it doesn't come into the container at all. Um, so, you know, I have had people say to me, well, you know, we don't need to do this anymore because we have containment and I find that to not always be true. You, that, that this is always still a good thing to do to understand the effect of what's going on in the room. So the next thing I started to do, I wanted to illustrate um, this idea of um, parameter variation because in the new version of CoolSim 4.2, we've added this uh, variational analysis where instead of just uh, turning cracks on and off like we used to be able to do, uh, now I can vary the temperature. So what I was after here um, is the idea of trying to dial in RTI so that it uh, was 100%. I mean, I've got these optimization parameters. Let's use them to try to optimize the data center and see what happens. So you'll see here, for run zero, I drop the flow rate of crack three. Now, the ones I'm modulating, by the way, Steve, are the ones that you've, that they're the chilled water units that, that uh, would lend themselves to variable speed drives. Yeah. Um, I didn't vary the others. So I did four, I think I did four uh, variations here. So first thing I did is to take um, this one, Liebert two, down, um, and then I stepped it down again, and then I stepped it. So I stepped it four times about 20% each, and uh, I also was stepping um, crack 1 from 13 to 11 to 9, and then I was stepping um, down here, Liebert 3 from 99 down. Okay, so run 0 is already down 20%, and then I, I keep going. And I wanted to show you what happens as you start to drive RTI to be 100% in a data center that is, um, you know, convective, natural convective return, uncontained. So here we are with the first run, and you'll see, first of all, let me show you RTI. RTI is better than it was. It's 63% uh, now. Okay, it was down in the 50s before. So I improved that, but look what happened to my RCI. It drops, it drops right off goes to 71. So, you know, I have seen, Magnus, and you've seen this too, where where vendors will come in. I mean, one of the big buzz things right now, buzzwords going on in the industry is save energy, let's put in variable speed fans, right? Mm -hmm. Let's get our RTI to 100%. And the way these are often driven is through pressure sensors under the floor. Mm -hmm. um, but what I find oftentimes is that um, if you don't do a good job with air separation in the room, uh, you're going to run into hot spots, so you've got to turn the fans back up. And I've been in a number of places where they've got variable speed fans installed. They paid to have them installed with the controllers and the new fans, not a trivial ex uh, expense, not a trivial investment. And I walk into the data centers and they're all running full tilt. Have you seen that as well? Yeah, I, th I think uh, if you're running your uh, variable speed drives on pressure sensors, you may well run into that situation. Uh, but but no one is debating if you should have variable sp speed drives. So right. uh, th that's a good thing. And 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 now we uh, we're getting more and more and cheaper and cheaper uh, sensors to put uh, in front of the cabinet. We don't need to use the pressure sensors as, as a surrogate for the real the real parameter we're interested in, and that is the supply into the rack. Right. And, and uh, so going forward, we're going to have a, 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 a great option to, to, to run the various speed drives directly on the information from, in, from the, in front of the cabinet. Yes. Yes. And you would need information from the front of all cabinets. So, you know, that, but, but that's coming. Um, now, one of the things to note here is that although I'm worse on my RCI high, you notice, Steve, that my the, the, the sort of the problem I'm having is up high. Uh, yes. So until you see a visual plot of it, you can't really tell how bad the situation is. I mean, if you look at just the numerics alone of RCI, you'll see that RCI high, you say that it looks, it looks quite bad. When you get in and look at the room, you know, the, the situation over here in this region isn't much worse than it was before, to be quite honest, even though we did run the temperature, the, uh, the flow rates down. Now, we have to be careful and look at the full range here to see the effect. We have to know how hot it's getting at the edge of these things. Mm -hmm. And you see that I'm getting up into the 90 degree, but yeah. don't worry too much about these corners because typically those, 
those aren't realizable anyway, you know, in a way. Yeah, the equipment isn't there. That's right. And you can manage your equipment placement <clears throat> using these kind of plots too. Go ahead, Magnus. Now I was just going to point out that uh, the, the RCI high, for example, it's not just an indication how many of the intakes are above the recommended range, but also how much they're above the recommended right. range. That's right. Uh, so if you're just showing uh, red for that they're above the recommended range, uh, that information, how much higher they are, is missing. That's right. That's why I showed this plot. This is the full range right here. Yep. But, but in, in the RCI, that is kind of baked into the whole equation. That's right. It is a weighted. Yeah, it is weighted for sure. Yep. So that's uh, that's and, and and it gets it continues to you know I mean it, as I walked up this uh, or Betty walked down the uh, flow rate curve, the uh, situation continues to to um, uh, get so here's the down down even down percent four percent MC. So it doesn't look like variable speed in this case, or it doesn't look like we're going to get to optimization. So uh, you know an optimized design, and so I, I took the metrics now. With Coolsim, you can take all the results and drag them into PowerPoint or to Excel. So I drag the summary reports into Excel and cut the cells out where it shows these plots, these uh, these uh, metrics, indices, and I plotted them and see what happens as I go from the base model, which was running at 56, and I start to march towards optimization of RTI. What happens to my RCI high is it declines. And I showed that graphically uh, with this with this picture, so you can see the two are very very tied together. Well, RCI high, um, I'm sorry, RCI low remains relatively constant. It does vary a little, but relatively constant. Um, what I'm running into is uh, problems up high on those racks. Mm -hmm. And one way to look at this graph, uh, Paul, is that when the blue curves uh, it slopes down towards the left. Mm -hmm. That means that we have more and more bypass in the space, and when we have more bypass in the space, the RCI high uh, will improve, of course, because we have more cool air circulating in the space. Mm -hmm. uh, and the vice versa is true too when you go to the right in this. So it's good to, this is a good way to get a feeling for you changing uh, one thing, one parameter, one metric, what's going to happen with other metrics. And what's really, what we're really coming down to here is an optimization problem. That's exactly right. So now, what, uh, what you know, just a few summaries as we wrap up here as we get on towards three. You know, it may look like n plus one on paper, but until you start to look at the models, it's unclear how it's you know how it's going to fall, how it's going to roll out, and it's done going to depend on which one's down. Um, and optimization for for energy efficiency is going to be difficult without separating hot and, and cold. Here we drove for energy efficiency with variable speed fans towards the end, trying to get RTI to 100%, but we ran into trouble right away. So in your in your current situation, I'm afraid, <laughs> Steve, you're going to have to live with bypass airflow until you can do some separation. Yeah, I'm afraid too. Now, what I, one of the things I began to do um, as I was working on this model is began to look at containment. So here is the modeler again. This is uh, the Coulson modeler. And you see here I'm beginning to try to help that end of the data center by, by doing a little containment. And what I'm doing here is, is hot aisle containment. I'm trying to protect this region from getting all this air leaking through it, trying to cool it off over there. Now, you know, the question of cost comes in and, and all the rest. but you know, to to take a look at return on investment, uh, and in in terms of the, the functionality, will it work? This is a fairly good way to do it. These again are simple baffles. Um, the baffle is a very nice tool to use inside of these modelers. You drag them in, set them for a certain percent open area. I don't know if I set that for probably just a few percent leakage in this case. And wrap them around that hot and see if you can capture the hot. And yeah, I've got it set for three percent. And when you do that, find out how much of an effect it has. Because I'm continuing to struggle with this particular section of the room right over here. I'm trying to keep this cool. So um, that that's what I started to look at. You can do a similar thing anywhere in the room. You've you know, fortunately, you're you're fairly well organized. Hot cold. You've got you know hot aisles here uh, set up already. It looks like you probably did that over some period of time, right? 
Yes. So you've aligned things fairly well, and the opportunity to use curtains or some other method in this region, of course, you've got issues with uh, can you get that by the, uh, the fire guys and, and so on. But just to understand if it can be done uh, and what benefit it would have, this is a, a fairly good thing to, uh, to experiment with. No, I'd agree with you. So let me now go ahead and uh, with that, if you guys have any more comments, otherwise we'll take questions from people. Uh, anyone who's watching can, can uh, text in a question and ask about it, but uh, uh, just ask my panel here uh, thoughts about uh, the design and Steve, I guess, where, where are you headed, what, what you're thinking? You know you're not N plus one today, so uh, you're, you're raising that flag already, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, we're we're looking at a couple of different things. One is um, trying to address what you talked about, right? So, I mean, the modeling itself just shows us those hot spots and how the airflow uh, creates sort of that hot space towards the right side of the room. Mm -hmm. um, also, given just some, you know, we just can't make the airflow work that way. So, we're even looking at uh, maybe for these high density cabinets, exchanger on the back of the cabinet uh, to see how that may play out. Um, to adjust this, mm -hmm. and then, uh, but it's, mm -hmm. it's done. So I mean, the modeling is the big key for us to help with, you know, not only just how the room is reacting and what's going on in the room, um, to get a better idea so we can make some adjustments to continue to improve it, but also that idea of okay, what if something fails, right? So I can run through a whole DR scenario and, business, and set up a business continuity plan based on this failure analysis without having to do anything. Um, physical in the data center. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, as well as, you know, this gives me an idea of where to move equipment, whether to move it out of the top of racks, um, and whether to move it from one rack to another as well, to, to better offset um, where I'm putting critical equipment versus, you know, test and development type computing equipment. Right, right. Yep. Okay, um, I guess there are no questions. Uh, Magnus, final thoughts before we go? No, I just want to point out again that this is a great tool to um, analyze the data center before, even before you have put the equipment there, and uh, uh, maybe it's going to raise some red flags. You can fix it before you roll in those uh, high density racks. Looks like we have one question coming in about cabling in your case. Uh, Steve, do you have uh, uh, overhead cabling, or is it inside the uh, raised floor? Um, the our all power is overhead. Mm -hmm. um, cabling is underneath the floor, um, but we've we're, we're actually migrating to, and we've done a, a good job already of migrating to rack based switches or mm -hmm. cabinet based switches. Mm -hmm. So the only cabling really beneath the floor is more of the uh, fiber uplinks from those switches. Mm -hmm. So we've really reduced any sort of blockage um, beneath the floor, and we're trying to open that up as much as possible. Yep. Yep. Well, okay. I think that's all for today, and uh, I want to thank my panel, Magnus and Stephen, for joining me today. And as I mentioned to those of you watching, if you'd like, there will be a recording of this put on our website. And if you'd like a certificate of, of participation, let me know, and I'll send one on out to you. Our emails are listed here at the end, and I'll leave those up for a moment for any of those, uh, for those of you who want. And, uh, and I look forward to doing another one of these in another month or so. If any of you have a data center that you'd like us to take a look at uh, in this kind of format, please let me know and we'll uh, take your model or you know, possibly create a model for you depending on your situation and uh, we'll take a look at it and see if we can provide you some guidance. Thanks everyone for attending and have a good day. <laughs>